Praise be Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, friends, family, and distinguished guests, what a great joy it is to be here together with you. Thank you so much for coming out. Even this terrible weather, we have a cathedral full of people coming to worship God in spirit and in truth. I greet your eminences, Cardinal Thomas Collins, Apostolic Administrator and Shepherd of this particular church for over 16 years, and Cardinal Gerard Cyprien Lacroix, Primate of Canada and Archbishop of the oldest diocese, Quebec. I welcome and acknowledge the numerous members of the lay faithful, the many archbishops and bishops, including many emeriti, that have come from across Canada, numerous priests and deacons, consecrated men and women, seminarians, and all of you here gathered in this wonderful cathedral basilica, the mother church of the archdiocese, consecrated to Almighty God under the patronage of St. Michael the Archangel. In a special way, I am most appreciative for the presence and participation of the papal representative to Canada, His Excellency Ivan Yurkovich, Archbishop and our Apostolic Nuncio, who has conveyed the papal mandate appointed me Archbishop and who has formally installed me as Chief Shepherd. Your Excellency, your presence with us today brings a special closeness of Pope Francis and reminds us all that we are part of the universal Church of Jesus Christ, called to walk together along the path of holiness. Please do convey to the Holy Father our filial sentiments and gratitude for the gifts of his ministry and witnessing. Je suis heureux de souligner la présence de l'archevêque de Montréal, Monseigneur Christian Lépine, Et je veux, j'aimerais le remercier pour le soutien, sa générosité exceptionnelle tout au long de ce temps. Je salue en particulier aussi l'évêque de Saint-Jérôme en Laurier, Monseigneur Raymond Poisson, président de la Conférence des évêques catholiques du Canada. Et à, avec vous et à travers vous, j'ai la joie de saluer tous les autres frères évêques francophones venus même de loin pour célébrer. Merci pour votre proximité et votre soutien fraternel. Wish to acknowledge the Most Reverend Gerard Burgi, Bishop of St. Catharines and President of the Assembly of Catholic Bishops of Ontario. Thank you for being here and I look forward to working collaboratively and intently with you and all the bishops of the Assembly, as well as in a more concerted fashion, the bishops of the Metropolitan Province of Toronto. I'm delighted that so many of our ecumenical and interfaith um, leaders, faith leaders, as well as our civic leaders, dignitaries, and members of the diplomatic corps have joined us today for the celebration. I truly value and respect our relationships, and I will work hard, hand in hand, for the welfare of our people in promoting the common good, the spiritual and social transformation and the promotion of the dignity of every human person. My family and friends from Montreal, from Ottawa, from the United States, and as far away as Australia, I thank you for your affectionate presence here today on this very solemn occasion and celebration of faith and fellowship. Grazie ai membri della mia famiglia qui presenti, Così pure ai miei familiari, gli amici, parrocchiani e fedeli della comunità italiana di Montreal che sono venuti per, eh, qui e poi coloro che ci seguono attraverso i mezzi sociali. Un caro saluto e un abbraccio a tutti voi, parenti e amici. A word of welcome to those many persons and communities who are participating through social media and especially through the auspices of Salt and Light in our own archdiocesan platforms. The first and most important of sentiments that must be expressed at this time is that of gratitude. Gra- gratitude to our Heavenly Father, to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to the Holy Spirit. Grateful for the love of God 
which is constantly being poured into our hearts by the same Spirit. Grateful for the salvation Christ brings us, the mercy He shows us, the compassion with which He lavishes us, the wisdom He shares with us, the courage He instills in us, the healing with which He cares for us, the forgiveness which He affords us, the grace with which He lifts us up, the holiness He communicates to us generously and abundantly. How could we ever live without God? I'm grateful to Pope Francis, who for us is Peter, and with whom we are in sincere and ecclesial communion acknowledging him as our universal shepherd, showing respect and filial obedience. As church here and together, we minister to God's holy people, cum Pedro et sub Pedro, as Vatican II tells us. We pray for his holiness as he guides and leads Holy Mother Church and for his faithful and fruitful ministry in confirming his brethren in faith. Before I go further, I would like to acknowledge a very special person to all of us, His Eminence Thomas Cardinal Collins. I wish to thank you for the very kind and gracious welcome you extended to me in this archdiocese at the time of my transition and from the moment of our first telephone conversation, February 11th. But most of all, on behalf of the Archdiocese of Toronto, I want to express our profound recognition of your faithful and fruitful ministry as its Archbishop for all of these past 16 years. The Cardinal has been outstand an outstanding witness to Christ. He is a kind and considerate pastor, a loving servant leader, who has effectively shepherded this local church and has vigorously navigated rough waters. He has given admirable testimony over the many years. In his selfless and committed ministry as a devoted spiritual father, he has put into place so many new initiatives for the growth of the faith and its flourishing. Your Eminence, may this new chapter of your life as Emeritus Bishop be marked by good health and deep spiritual joy. On this most holy of liturgical celebrations, we commemorate the incarnation of God. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ was conceived in the immaculate womb and the loving heart of the blessed ever Virgin Mary and through her wholehearted consent. How can we not stop and give thanks for the gift of Christ, our Savior, who came to us through Mary and through still in our days, is born in our hearts, in our families, and in our communities by the power of the Most High and through the prayers of the Mother of God, Theotokos, and Mother of the Church. The creative, life-giving, and world-changing fiat of that teenager Miriam of Nazareth, I am the servant of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word, becomes a model of response to the Lord's many and diverse callings as it epitomizes those Christian and human virtues of openness and gentleness, courage and compassion, humility and purity, charity and faith, attitudes that should always imbue our responses to the loving Lord of our lives. She is a gift that the Lord offers to us. She must be known, loved, welcomed, and served. She makes Jesus real and personal to us through the action of the Holy Spirit. 
The Annunciation, as the Church Fathers remind us, can be a daily experience as with and like Mary, we open our hearts, we open our relationships, we open our families and our communities so that Christ is born anew therein and fills us with the blessedness and joys of the kingdom. Our greatest claim is that we are servants of the Lord and no one better than the mother is able to teach us this important lesson. I am very grateful for the service given by those who, in addition to the auxiliary bishops, are a diocesan priest's first and closest collaborators, the priests. I look to them, to you here present and those who could not make it today, as co-workers and supporters, as sons and brothers, as friends and fellow missionary disciples, co-responsible for the mission of evangelization. I am thankful for the gift of the calling of, to the priesthood of Jesus Christ. I am grateful for the priests of this archdiocese who selflessly and generously give their lives for the life of their communities. Ordained as a priest over 26 years ago, I often look back and am so grateful for the fine examples of the missionary priests in my own home parish. They were the palpable presence of Christ to us. They mediated the grace which brings Jesus to life within us, enabling us to live a supernatural life of holiness, all the while with both feet on the ground serving others with compassion and generosity. The world needs priests because the world needs Christ. Priests speak to us of Jesus. Give us Jesus. Love like Jesus. Show us Jesus. And bring, through the ministry of the Word and Sacrament, His kingdom to life in our lives. One of the aspects I loved most in my ministry has been teaching at the different levels of the academic structures, high school, seminary, and university. I especially enjoyed lecturing patristics and patrology. One of the mo and a most beautiful, inspiring passage comes to us from St. Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, he was the second bishop of Antioch, was arrested, condemned to death, and transported to Rome to be thrown to the wild beasts in the arena and martyred in the year 107. In the course of his journey to Rome, he wrote seven letters to various churches on a variety of topics, including the organization of the church. In his letter to the Christians in, in Ephesus, he spoke specifically about the need for unity and harmony. And these are themes very close to my heart. He wrote, and I quote, I'm taking the opportunity to urge you to be united in conformity with the mind of God. For Jesus Christ, our life, without whom we cannot live, is the mind of the Father. Just as the bishops appointed over the whole world are in conformity with the mind of Jesus Christ. It is fitting, therefore, that you should be in agreement with the mind of the bishop, as in fact you are. Your excellent presbyters, who are a credit to God, are as suited to the bishop as strings to a harp, so that your harmony of mind and heart, in your harmony of mind and heart, the song you sing is Jesus Christ. Every one of you should form a choir so that in harmony of sound and through the harmony of hearts and in unity taking the note from God, you may sing with one voice through Jesus Christ to the Father. If you do this, he will listen to you and see from your good works that you are members of his Son. It is then an advantage to you to live 
in perfect unity so that all, at all times you may share in God. It's a beautiful image. Strings on the harp playing and singing in harmony. It's a wonderful ideal to pursue together in tandem. I'd like to express gratitude to the permanent deacons and their wives, the entire diaconal community. Thank you for your service and dedication to the life of the church and for witnessing to Christ the servant in your work with the needy and the vulnerable. Through your pastoral and liturgical ministry, social and charitable works, you share in Christ's mission and grace in a very special way. And there's a delightful little sentence again of St. Ignatius of Antioch in one of his letters. He said, Let everyone revere the deacons as Jesus Christ, the bishop as the image of the Father, and the presbyters as the Senate of God and Assembly of the Apostles. For without them, one cannot speak of the Church. Consecrated life, as we know, is a tremendous gift to the Church and to the wider society. I am very pleased to know of the many committed women and men of consecrated life who, through their prophetic witnessing, contribute enormously to building up the body of Christ in this archdiocese and have for many, many years. Through the living out of the religious vows, they witness us to us the beauty of belonging entirely to the Lord, of living for Him and of serving Him through the manifold apostolates they have established and in which their charisms continue to inspire new generations. Speaking of new generations, allow me to speak to and about young people. Again, in ministry, I thoroughly loved during my years in pastoral parochial ministry. The youth are a gift to us. They're a gift to our families, to our communities of faith, and to the wider society. Youth brings strength, idealism, and hope for the future. They need to be loved and accompanied, listened to and cherished, welcomed and witnessed to, and we need to give them our attention, our time, our means, and our wisdom. The Holy Father wrote in his exhortation, Christus Vivit, keep following your hopes and dreams, but be careful about one temptation can, that can hold us back. It is anxiety. Anxiety can work against us by, make, by making us give up whatever we do not see instant results. Our best dreams are only attained through hope, patience, and commitment, and not in haste. At the same time, we should not be hesitant or afraid to take chances and make mistakes. I remember long ago, when I was 18 years old and had just applied to enter the seminary in Montreal, I had been an altar server for many years in my home parish, Our Lady of Consolata. Our parish was staffed by many dedicated pastors of souls, dynamic missionaries. I remember especially the energy, the creativity, and the generosity of our pastor back then, Father Edmenegildo Crespi. Another loving priest was Father Luigi Testa, God rest his soul. One day, when we were about to begin Mass, at the sacristy door, he stopped me and he said to me, I heard that you asked to enter the seminary and to become a priest. This is very good, and I am proud of you. There is nothing more beautiful than to give your youth to the Lord. These words have remained deep inside of me and have never left my heart. In Italian, I can still hear him say, Non c'è niente più bello che dare la tua gioventù al Signore. So I appeal to the young people here this morning and throughout the Archdiocese. Do not be afraid of the world. 
Do not be afraid to give your life in service to others. Do not be afraid to dream big dreams, to want to transform the world. Do not be afraid to commit to Jesus and to his gospel. Do not be afraid to love the church and to be an integral part of her witnessing and to live a life of heroic virtue. Do not be afraid to give your youth to the Lord. Stay close to your parish church and to the movements and associations in the church. Get involved in the realities of school, of neighborhood, and social needs. Share your talents. Discover your giftedness. Ask the Lord to reveal to you His will for your life, your authentic vocation. Reach out to others. Let Jesus into your heart and allow Mother Mary to take you by the hand. Whenever a new bishop arrives in the diocese that he is called to lead and serve, there are no doubts, many questions. Who is he? Where does he come from? What's the story? What makes him tick? You can find some answers to these questions in the program provided. <laughs> My biography is all there, as I like to put it, one of the best obituaries I've ever had the pleasure of reading. <laughs> in my message to the people of God in Toronto at the time of my appointment, I shared a little about myself and my leadership. I spoke about being a son of Italian immigrants from the old country, where respect, sacrifice, hard work, family, faith, and taking care of one another were and remain vital. Now we know that Bishop Michael Power, buried here below in the crypt, was the first Bishop of Toronto, and that he came from the Archdiocese of Montreal, where he had been serving as Vicar General. Sounds and feels very familiar. <laughs> Sometimes I stop and ask myself how he must have felt. Toronto was quite different back then with thousands of Catholics, mainly of Irish, immigrants. The spiritual and social challenges were many back then, as they are now. I pray, and I ask you all to pray for me that I will serve with the same courage and wisdom, with his committed pastoral zeal and love for the people, and to serve until death with fidelity, with heart and generosity. With respect to my vision for the Archdiocese, I will take the necessary time to come to know the priests, the deacons, the religious and the faithful of our local church and the other key players in the life of the larger community, civil and otherwise. I will listen to you. From you, I would like to learn about our community of faith, about its history, its rich diversity, its changing trends and the challenges before us then together we shall discern the signs of the times. I appreciate even more the many wonderful ministries that already exist and are thriving. I wish to welcome together the, gra the grace-filled opportunities which lie before us. It is only then, together, we can set forth a vision of, wh of where we would like to go as church, rooted in sacred scripture and sacred tradition, working out of the deposit of faith and in an openness to the newness and the surprises that the Holy Spirit will show us and provide for us as missionary disciples. And as we reach out to all peoples and all communities at the peripheries and at the center, we seek to become a friend, a neighbor, a brother, and a sister to all. And as we sang in the entrance hymn, for we can only wonder at every gift you send, at blessings without number and mercies without end. There are, however, some aspects of our witnessing that are known and which will never change. For example, our care for the poor and the marginalized, our outreach to the neglected and the forgotten, our welcoming of 
migrants, displaced persons, and refugees. Our defense of human life and its, and its dignity at all of its stages. Protecting and promoting the sacredness of holy matrimony and of the family. The gift of Catholic education to be encouraged. The institutions of health care and social services to be fostered and recognized for the outstanding works of mercy. Our common and collaborative endeavors with persons of different faith traditions in building a more fraternal and just society, all the while addressing the systemic and structural deficiencies at hand. Our efforts at healing and reconciliation with the indigenous persons who have suffered much. Our protection of minors and vulnerable adults and the preventing of all forms of abuse. Our care for our common home. Our engagement in the social networks of our society. All of this is part of our common calling and how vital it is to come together to work in tandem so that even in our beloved country, men and women of faith are able to worship and to be respected through policies and laws that seriously and conscientiously honor the makeup of our society that is made up of many people of faith and cultural traditions. Furthermore, how attentive we must be in and remain in avoiding harmful and divisive ideologies that corrode the moral and spiritual fabric of our lives. We know and we weep for the violence that is taking place in different parts of the world, in Ukraine and in other countries and continents. We hear and we are heartbroken at the knowledge of how basic human rights and freedoms, in primis, religious freedom, are being trampled upon. In no way can we remain silent before such injustices and the different forms of persecution we see. We must stand strong. We must love the world. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son to save it. But we must not kneel before it, as Jacques Maritain prophetically wrote that's decades ago. If we want to be guided by the Holy Spirit, as we read in the Acts of the Apostles regarding the early church, we must at all costs remain humble and meek, learning from our Lord and Our Lady. It is only in emptying ourselves the gospel kenosis that we will be led and animated by Jesus' Spirit and making a lasting, lasting contribution to the church and to the world. Arrogance and pride, self-sufficiency, spiritual worldliness and self-reference are vices and attitudes that are destructive and divisive and always a temptation. We need to reject them vehemently and remain in an attitude of self-effacing humility. We are called and empowered to bring people together, to bring people together to God and God to them, to lift people up, to provide and foster opportunities of grace so that they may receive and shine with the bright light of Christ. But not just shine. We are to enlighten our surroundings and the lives of those around them. There's a beautiful phrase of the angelical doctor Thomas Aquinas in his Magnum Opus Thomas Theologica. He says, Sicut maius est illuminare quam lucere solum. That is, it is better to bright, to enlighten, than merely to shine. We have, not, we have received the gift of faith, and we carry within us the light of Christ, not to be kept hidden under a bushel, we must not merely shine, but rather seek to enlighten the lives of others. With humility, we do this. Or rather, we allow the Spirit in us to illumine persons and communities through us. The challenges before us are many. During his recent pilgrimage of penance to Canada, at the beautiful Cathedral of Notre Dame de Quebec in Quebec City, 
During evening prayer, Pope Francis highlighted three pointed challenges in, in proclaiming Jesus Christ today. One, to make Jesus known. Two, to witness. And three, fraternity. I hope that we will be able, as a church community, to engage with and unpack together these insights in building our future. Since my ordination to the Episcopacy, every day I reread the nine promises that a bishop makes during the rite of consecration, by which sacrament of holy orders he becomes a successor of the apostles. They're a daily reminder of who I am, or rather, rather to whom I have committed my life and how I am to live. One of these nine promises in part reads, do you resolve to guide the holy people of God in the way of salvation as a devoted father? This hits home for me, since the marital nuptial symbolism of the relationship between a bishop and the diocese is very meaningful and powerful. In fact, one of the symbols which is given to a newly ordained bishop is a ring. It's my wedding band. It signifies a covenantal bond, a true marriage. It speaks to fidelity and to selflessness, self-sacrifice, unconditional love, fruitfulness, and long, lifelong commitment. It's a daily reminder that I am wedded to the church, my bride, this archdiocese in particular, and that I am to give my life for her as a loyal and committed husband, as a devoted father, as the promise goes. It is a rich symbolism. Picking up from one American prelate's astute observation, of course, my appointment to Toronto is an arranged marriage. And Pope Francis is the wise matchmaker. <laughs> now, what an arranged marriage is, the expectation, of course, is that in due time, the spouses get to know each other and come to love one another. Now, given that I'm 51 years old and that bishops normally retire at the, at the age of 75, we've got about a quarter of a century to get to know each other and to fall in love. As in all successful marriages, Commitment, patience, forgiveness, and sacrifice will be required. It's a covenant of love, of fidelity, marked by and founded upon the grace of Jesus Christ. Our lives are interwoven by divine providence. The Lord guides the events that make up our salvation history personally and in community. I trust and firmly believe that the Lord will not let us down and he will generously pour out his love into our hearts so that we may love one another and all people with the life-giving, unconditional, fruitful, creative love of Jesus. Know of my commitment to you. For now, Toronto is my new home and you are my family. Now we must address the proverbial elephant in the room, the leaves and the habs. Well, in keeping with the symbolism of marriage, I'm told that the ability to compromise is essential for a lasting marriage. However, I think we're going to probably need some marriage counseling for this one. <laughs> in conclusion, as we make our journey together, be assured of my prayers and my closeness as we proclaim together the gospel of Jesus Christ and our active and our pastoral care and our creative outreach, the Lord will continue to be our strength and we will know holiness of life and greatness of soul. It is a holiness that can only come from reclining like his beloved disciple upon the Christ's Eucharistic and sacred heart. Eucharistic adoration will allow Christ to gradually transform our hearts so that we may be ready to receive the wisdom, the strength, so as to spend our lives 
in service to God through service to others. It is the way of Christ. Brothers and sisters, let us be one in beseeching the maternal intercession of Mary, our Blessed Mother. May her example of charity, of openness, of trust, of faithfulness be our strength, our light, and our guide. And invoking the intercession of the powerful patron saint of Archdiocese, St. Michael the Archangel, may be we united in faith and ministry, truly strive to become one heart and one soul, and resisting all divisions, celebrate the Eucharistic sacrifice together as a community of believers and as a family. In doing so, always and everywhere, celebrating, echoing Mary's fiat with her steadfast fidelity and humility, we call down upon us the powerful and abundant blessings of Almighty God. I conclude with these beautiful poetic and challenging sentiments of Pope Saint Paul VI. They resonate with me, and I hope they resonate with you as well. We will love those who are near and those who are far from us. We will love our country and that of others. We will love our friends. We will love our enemies. We will love all social classes, but especially those most in need of help, of assistance and advancement. We will love the young and the old, the poor and the sick. We will love those who mock us, those who scorn us, those who oppose us, and who persecute us. We will love those who deserve, and we will love those who do not deserve to be loved. We will love our adversaries. We will want no one to be our enemy. We will love our times, our civilizations, our technologies, our arts, our sports, our world. We will love striving to understand, to have compassion, to esteem, to serve, and to suffer. We will love with the heart of Christ. Amen, and God bless you.